morning to everybody and in particular to my four panelists. You only see three of them, but I, I actually now you see the fourth one. So uh, Ulrike, uh, unfortunately, can only join us remotely. But let me say we're very happy that you were able to uh, still make it uh, virtually. So those of you who attended our virtual ECB forum last year, um, may remember the lively panel that we had back then on the future of inflation. Charles Goodhart criticized in his intervention back then what he called the bootstrap theory of inflation. Namely, and he explained it uh, as follows, as long as inflation expectations are anchored, inflation will remain anchored. Ricardo Reif was in the audience at the time, and I think it's fair to say that he strongly objected to Charles's fundamental critique, arguing that, and I quote again, so you see whatever you say here may come back next year. <laughs> Inflation expectations are very useful in so far as they reflect whether people believe in the central bank. This interesting debate gave rise to the idea to follow up on this important question in this year's ECB forum. And I think it's fair to say that this panel could hardly be more timely. Back in September 2021, so that was a time of the last panel, HICP inflation in the euro area was standing at 3.4%, and it has now accelerated to a staggering 8.1%. Market-based measures of longer-term inflation expectations, the five-year, five-year inflation swap, stood around 1.75 in September last year, rose to almost 2.5% earlier this year, and has now settled slightly above 2% in recent weeks. Survey-based measures of inflation expectations have gradually crept up towards our 2% inflation target, or have even moved above 2% as the median in our consumer expectations survey. In the baseline scenario of our staff projections, inflation is projected to stay high for an extended period of time, but to return to around 2% over the medium term. And these developments raise a number of important questions for policymakers, and this is precisely what we would like to discuss in today's panel. So what is and should be the role of inflation expectations in monetary policy making? Which inflation expectations do actually matter? Those embedded in market prices, those by professional forecasters, or those by households and firms? How can we detect risks of de-anchoring? And finally, how can policymakers ensure that inflation expectations remain well anchored when inflation is expected to remain above target over a prolonged period of time. So these are the questions that I want to discuss with my four excellent panelists, which I will introduce one by one as they speak. And it is, of course, natural to start where the discussion ended last year. So I'm delighted to give the floor to Ricardo Reis, who is professor of economics at the London School of Economics and who last fall published a fascinating Brookings paper on losing the inflation anchor. At the time of our previous ECB forum, Ricardo was of the view that inflation expectations in the euro area most likely would stay anchored. But he asked central banks to make clear that if inflation turned out to be permanent, they would do whatever it takes to stay within their mandate of price stability. So, of course, we are excited to hear how your views have evolved since then. Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, wait, my glass is going to fall. Well, thank you so much for having me to talk here about inflation expectations. And so let me try to give you where I think inflation expectations are in the euro area right now and what challenges they pose for monetary policy. But to start, how do we go about measuring expectations? As Isabel already noted, we have three options. We can ask people, and for that, the best publicly available data is the one produced by the Bundesbank, which has an online survey on consumer expectations with data available since 2019. 
and soon we'll also have one conducted by the ECB coming live. We all know, or not we all, some of you may know that when one asks surveys of people of expected inflation, you always worry about the fact that people have biases, they overreact to news, and more generally that over the last 20 years when inflation was very stable, the signal to noise ends up being very small, partly because there is so much noise in this data. Moreover, not only we can ask people about inflation's one year ahead, or we can ask them at longer horizons, but whether you ask three, five, or 10 years, you tend to get the same answer. Indeed, the Bundesbank asks five and 10 years ahead and pretty much gets the same answer, showing that people really can't distinguish that much between these different horizons. If you ask markets, you can, the best publicly available data is the ECB survey professional forecasters, now complemented again soon with the survey monitoring analysts. And that, on the one hand, has a lot of signal to noise and does quite well in the previous 20 years, but suffer from strategic behavior. Many of these professionals want to look different from others. After all, often they are paid for their advice, and that advice better be a little bit different than everyone else. But at the same time, they suffer from conformism insofar as they spend a lot of time in conferences like this and end up being driven by the arguments in it. And more importantly, as in that Brookings paper I noted, if you look at the record of when we had large turning points and we had good professionals data, early 1970s US, inflation going up, Volcker inflation going down, the professionals were way off. They really were completely, they were as surprised as central bank, I guess, is a way of putting it. Third option is to measure market prices using inflation swaps, options, in the case of the US, break-evens, in the euro less so, where the difficulties there is that you need to um, take out compensation for risk, and we know how the price and quantity of risk in markets changes a lot, as well as just noise having to do with liquidity and all kinds of trading frictions beyond adjusting in rises and payoffs. Let me do that. Let me look at these three types. By doing that, I'm plotting here from the Bundesbank, one year ahead, the expected inflation. Important, you need to adjust it, and I have a simple formula there that you barely can read that comes from previous work that I had to adjust for standard deviation and skewness, which is a very simple way to back out the noise, to take out some of the biases of people. The market's in blue and the professional's in green. It's clear that um, we have... Um, it's clear that the, um, in 2021, households started moving faster a little bit than the markets did, uh, but both very much together. And then in 2022, we have especially the market prices rising significantly more as perhaps the, you start having risk compensation increasing uh, as a recession became more likely and high inflation starts being associated with the recession therefore making sense of why blue got a little bit steeper than red after they had moved together. The professionals were mostly useless in detecting the increase in the inflation one year ahead. Um, and notably, in the last three months, and as we, as we, as we um, um, expect the new wave of the Bundesbank survey, which will come pretty soon, uh, what we see is actually that from the markets, the older we have, very steady market prices, if anything, a reversal as monetary policy tightens and again, let's wait for what the people think. That's the one year ahead, and one that we can judge and say, well, some people were, apologies for my rudeness, a little useless insofar as we already know a little bit what the inflation was or is very likely to be. But let's look at the harder question, but maybe the more important question. What if one looks five years ahead, and where perhaps we can also average over the biases and over interpretation of people? Well, five years ahead, you see a very similar pattern where households increased, markets much more, more after January, and again, the professionals lag behind. So if you want to think about whether inflation are anchored in the sense of the next five years, you get a similar image of uh, somewhat of a de-anchoring starting after I made those statements, Isabel, and speeding up at the beginning of this year. Now, this, if you want, looks at all three of them, but in trying to, instead of pick between the three, why not use a method that tries to combine them to come up with a method? And here's a lot of equations to convince you that I'm serious, but this all to say that these are a model that tries to extract some of the biases, allows for overreaction, sluggishness, and essentially combines these three lines, these three series, with measures of disagreement and skewness that allow you to put more or less weight on the people versus the markets. If you do that, here is what fundamental, or Eurozone uh, expected five-year inflation is since starting in 2024. I purposely did not put a number in the vertical axis. Why? Because that's an assumption. I have to start it somewhere. 
If I started at 2, then expected inflation would have risen to 5. If I started at 1, it will have risen to 4. What happened? Why does it increase in these two steps? Well, first, when one looks at the data to decompose what the model is doing, is that skewness and dispersion increased at first in mid-2021. And then, as the market prices rose, the model says, aha, indeed, expected inflation must have increased. First, the skewness and dispersion, then the asset prices, finally, the median changes. What happened in the very last data point, the very sharp increase in markets, and given the difficulty in this model accounted for change in composition of risk, maybe perhaps lead to an overstatement. So I don't completely buy that last number over there. Let's wait for a little more data. It's probably half a percentage to 1% lower. Either way, the new anchor, if before, let's say, was 1%, now seems to be 2.5, or maybe even as high as 3.5 or so, according to what the data on expectations is showing. Why is that? Well, the picture from the Bundesbank survey shows it somewhat clearly. This is the histogram of the answers that people are giving. And what you see is that it's not just that stations are an anchor in the sense of a flatter distribution. The distribution has shifted horizontally to the right now, to 1.5% to 2% higher. If one starts from the perspective of that, now, let's good and bad, glass half full, glass half empty, um, is on the one hand, they are stable now at somewhere like, again, 4% here. Once it corrects for biases, composition for risks, and others, one could say it's more like a 3 to 4% is the right amount. And note, before you start dismissing, oh, households, I go to too many conferences where people say, oh, these households, I don't, they don't know what they're talking about. Remember how they were pretty much on track, not so the professionals, when it came to the one year. And now, think about it. If inflation is 8% this year, 5 next year, 3 the other, and 2 and 2, that averages to exactly 4. That does not seem like a crazy, out-of-touch household. May not be the outcome one wants, but certainly one that seems somewhat plausible. Moreover, perhaps German households are particularly sensitive, and therefore this is an upper bound. But this is to say that this is a reasonable estimate. On the other hand, is this a worrying estimate? Perhaps, if for five years, average, again, having an estimate around 3.5%, seems reasonable, if instead it was 4% in a five-year, five-year horizon, that would be worrying given a target of two. But as I told you, you really cannot torture the data to tell you that because the people just don't distinguish this very well. And moreover, it is not that now institutions are an anchor. They are anchored at some number above the 2% target. Whether that's two and a half, three, I don't know, but certainly somewhat above two. If you want to look at longer horizons in a five-year, five-year horizon, then you really want to, the only way you can do is markets. Markets do separate five-year, five-year from five years ahead. Um, and there, like I said, you struggle with separating for plausible risk premia. This increase all in the Eurozone um, uh, five-year, five-year um, expected inflation, I think can be too glibly dismissed as purely composition for risk. That would be a 1.2% in composition for risk change in inflation. That's what some of the estimates from the ECB models would say. It's very hard to write a model that has a 1.2% increase in a risk premium with no change in fundamental whatsoever over this period. But let me leave it at that. Um, to say instead that if your measures, if one looks at the distributions, or sorry, let me sleep ahead. If one uses distributions to back out instead these probabilities of inflation being high in this five-year, five-year horizon, what one gets is that the ECB and takes that as a measure of credibility insofar as being this far horizon, one gets a perhaps worrying, perhaps not shocking, increase from essentially zero to around 6% around January, December, but since then, very little change. These are the very last numbers that I calculated two days ago. Uh, for June is the last number. You get, again, a 6%, 8% um, likelihood if you want, then maybe the ECB will not be able to control inflation to 2% at this long horizon, which again seems credible, and again, grass half full, glass half empty. But should you care? If I, if I, having looked at the data, I conclude that expectations seem reasonable, sensible. The data is giving sensible things. And they say that perhaps the inflation expectations are a little above where the target is and with a risk of staying above higher. Should you care? Well, for that, you need a model. And so let me write the simplest new Keynesian model, the three Keynesian model, because I thought it would be the more familiar to this audience. But I think the points I'm going to make are independent of really the model itself. What happens when you have rational expectations? Well, expected inflation stays on target, at the target being pi upper bar. And it de actual inflation deviates from that insofar as we have either shocks to potential, 
what I called here A, where if you have a very, if you're a very hawkish central bank with a high phi, then you really kill those and you achieve the so-called divine coincidence. And in response to intended supply shock to the gap to inefficient potential, well, inflation again rises, but how much depends on how dovish you are. And if you are infinitely dovish, you really let interest rates respond a lot to any deviation of uh, output gap, then you end up with Z, the coef Z coefficient there goes to one. Essentially, all of the shock goes to inflation. So then, what happens if we have measures of expected inflation, pi E, that you measured, the numbers I showed you, and that turned out to have gone up? Well, if they are pure noise, you should not respond to them. Theta should be zero in the response function of the central bank. Of course, if they're pure noise, you're just introducing noise to monetary policy. You would be tightening too much by responding to my, mm, things seem to be a little bit above two, perhaps. But what if people, in all their stupidity, wrongness, answering things wrong, act on it? That is, they, from the first equation, what if people expect inflation, set higher wages, and or set higher prices in the case of firms, what if people get expecting higher inflation, therefore taking account of lower real returns on their savings, decide to spend more, and through hand to mouth, it end up again expecting inflation comes with more consumption spending? Well, if that is the case on both of them, then you want definitely to respond to expected inflation. For even if this pi e was a deviation of expectations, as long as people are responding to it, they are pushing up aggregate demand, they're pushing up aggregate supply. They're just raising wages, raising prices, raising consumption as a response to it. What if instead people, when, the, when they're raising their expectations, are overreacting the supply shocks? Maybe it's all about the supply shock Z, but that Z sadly comes with, again, these very, very terrible citizens that we have to shepherd coming with raising their inflation expectations with a coefficient beta there that can be maybe small, maybe large. Some people often will say, oh, people just overreact supply shocks. They shouldn't be doing it. Again, if they do, though, they're going to spend more, set higher wages, set higher prices. At a minimum, the central bank wants to overreact as much as they do, and potentially more, depending on how much you care about inflation output and how dovish or hawkish you are. But if people overreact, they act as they also, they not overreact in their survey answers, they overreact in their behavior. And if they overreact in their behavior, then to offset the inflation that comes from it, one has to overreact as well. And finally, what if instead it's long run credibility? What if instead these overreactions are coming up as a deviation of expectations that persists over time? In that case, the central bank, in order to keep inflation on target, need not just react to it, but actually react extremely swiftly and very aggressively. This is sometimes what's seen as the unanchoring of expect long run expectations, for that is the only way to keep a to prevent a prolonged and very large deviation of inflation from target as a result of those unanchored, slowly moving expectations of inflation that arose. So again, now you want to have a very high theta, a theta that's at least as large as delta, that is the extent to which people are myopic uh, um, in their expectations. To conclude, if policy is just not only and only if you think that the drift of expectations is pure noise that no one is acting on, nothing in the short run, nothing in the long run, should you ignore it. Otherwise, a movement up is a tightening, and how much one tightens depends on whether you think it's driving actions, responding to markup shocks, leads to more reaction, and doubts and credibility. To conclude, can we measure expected inflation accurately? No. And yet, we can look at data and get signals. And the signals that come, looking both now exposed at the performance of our people from expectations a year ago, and now that we have a year of data to see the inflation, tell us that, and then contrast that with the five-year expectations, give a coherent account that, in my view, makes it hard to dismiss expectations as being irrelevant or a bottle something theory. I forgot what the name was that you said, Isabel, that Charles had said last year. What is the best measure of expected inflation, Isabel asked in her introduction? None. Better to combine them. Combining them suggests an anchor that is somewhere around 3 to 4%. On the one hand, fine, that may be consistent with even projects what inflation will do. On the other hand, concerning if it persists, but with some upside risk. A longer horizons, is the ECB target still credible? Yes, it's a small probability of 5, 6% that is being revealed by the market prices. But at the same time, there is a little bit of that upside risk. And so given the upside risk, both in the short run and in the long run, should a central bank respond to noisy upside risk? And the answer is that unless you're very confident that this is truly noise, then not even the guys saying, 
are taking seriously. They're not even taking themselves seriously, the response to surveys. Otherwise, it suggests tightening with a different vigor depending on whether you think it is driving the measures up. And I've gone way over time, apologies, but your answer to Charles Goodhart, measure expectations matter for monetary policy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for an excellent presentation. Um, uh, let me now come to the second speaker. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Loretta Mester, who is president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Cleveland and uh, a very vocal member of the Federal Open Market uh, Committee. Not so long ago, Loretta said uh, in a speech delivered at another ECB conference that a risk management perspective argues for caution because inflation risks are to the upside and because the longer inflation runs above our goal, the higher the risk that long-term inflation expectations will become unanchored, thereby making the return to price stability much more costly. We are very happy to hear uh, more about how the Fed is using such a risk management approach. So thank you so much for being here, Loretta. We are very much looking forward to your intervention. Okay. Well, thank you. Isabel, thank you fellow panelists, and thanks ECB for inviting me to, to speak today. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and the whole conference has just been wonderful. So what I thought I would do in brief opening remarks is talk about inflation expectations from a practitioner's point of view um, and a practitioner from uh, the US. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about theory, a little bit about uh, practice, and then sort of an approach. So. Very simply, you know, inflation expectations have been a central feature um, in models of inflation dynamics since the 60s and 70s. Phelps, Friedman, Lucas all talked about the role of inflation expectations. And they do play a key role in the new Keynesian DSG models that are used to inform monetary policy at many central banks across the, uh, the globe. Now, in many of the central bank inflation models, some measure of a resource uh, utilization gap um, helps to determine um, inflation. Uh, uh, lagged inflation is included in the models to capture inertia in the inflation uh, process. And some measure of inflation expectations is included um, in the model. And you know, the different models put different weights on these three factors, but household and business expectations matter since they affect wage demands and offers and therefore the firm's uh, price setting behavior. And you know, the Cleveland Fed has an institute on inflation and um, inflation research, and they've been doing a lot of research. And they've, they've found that including measures of inflation expectations actually impro improves the inflation forecasting models, although I know there are papers out there that find that they don't improve them that much. Anecdotal information indicates that businesses do base pricing decisions on their expectations about inflation. Um, and there's recent research that documents that high inflation, ex uh, high inflation expectations cause firms or lead firms to raise their prices. The inflation expectations, and this is something Ricardo talked about, also provide an indication of how credible the public finds the central bank's commitment to achieving its, its policy goals. So if you look at the Federal Reserve's monetary policy framework, um, it emphasizes the role of well-anchored inflation expectations in helping to maintain and achieve price stability. And, and it wasn't until 2012 that the FOMC actually first established an explicit 2% longer run goal for inflation. And then when we revised our statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy in 2020, um, it really emphasized the role that the committee um, puts on longer-term inflation expectations that need to be well anchored at 2% um, and, and their contribution to helping us achieve um, both of our policy goals, full employment or maximum employment and price stability. So now the problem is there's various ways to define well anchored. Um, so here I'm going to be using well anchored to mean longer-term inflation expectations that are insensitive to the data and are at levels consistent with 2% inflation. And of course, this definition then would depend on the public understanding the central bank's inflation goal and how strongly it believes the central bank is committed to returning inflation to goal when it's deviated. So what that underscores is the role or the very important role that central bank communications plays in really keeping inflation expectations anchored and via that channel uh, 
communications can help mitigate the persist persistence of shocks to inflation. So, you know, if you go back to the three factors here, inflation expectations that are anchored can help mitigate the pull of resource gaps on inflation, and therefore, the cyclical movements in interest rates that policymakers induce to maintain price stability need not be as large as when inflation expectations are not well anchored. And I think this is consistent with what Ricardo just talked about. And that's particularly useful at the zero lower bound um, when it constrains interest rates. So, you know, arguably the U.S. would have had much lower inflation during the Great Recession had inflation expectations not been relatively stable offsetting some of that influence uh, the negative output gap had on inflation. And similarly, in the face of today's very high inflation readings, if inflation expectations were to become unanchored, then their influence would offset the impact of any beneficial change in the output gap in monetary policy would have to act much more forcefully to return inflation to the goal. So the, I think the theory is very compelling. I mean, I think, you know, Theory is very compelling. Real world doesn't always cooperate. So, you know, you remember Japan, right? For a long time, inflation expectations have run well above their actual inflation rates for a number of years. So, one of the first things a policymaker has to do is to confront that, you know, the theory speaks of inflation expectations, but those expectations are not directly observable. I mean, in the model, you know, if you have rational expectations model, right, the unobservability doesn't come into it because the inflation expectations are model consistent, so you can calculate them. But in the real world, that's not, not true. So we look at a, different, a number of different measures, and Ricardo showed a number of measures for um, the Eurozone. Um, these measures differ by type of agent um, and time horizon. And there's measures based on consumer surveys, there's surveys of businesses, there are professional forecasters um, surveys, and then there's the measures derived from financial markets. Now, in practice, I think if you want to get an indication of where inflation expectations are and where they're going, you need to look at all those measures. You can't just pick one. Um, but when you do that, you see that a clear signal isn't always forthcoming. Some of the measures move in different ways. Um, and the research just shows that different groups of agents can behave very differently from one another. Um, the literature has not informed us, not firmly established, whose expectations matter most for inflation dynamics. And even within a particular group of agents, even if you say consumers, there's considerable heterogeneity across consumers. So we're, we're doing some measures which we call indirect consumer inflation expectations at the Cleveland Fed. And basically, it's an idea based on indirect utility. So you ask the question, OK, given the basket of goods you buy, so it's personal to the person answering the survey, how much would your income have to rise in a year or a five-year horizon for you to be as well off so you can still afford that basket? So in other words, rather than sort of ask them directly, tell us what your expect you know, what's your expectations of inflation, a lot of our work says people don't even know what inflation is, right? What, what's this indirect thing? If you look at that, what, what we, we get in the data is, is these expectations of inflation from this indirect measure, and this is in the literature elsewhere, they vary by demographic and socioeconomic factors. So women tend to have higher expectations than men. Um, you know, more wealthy people have higher expectations. So again, that isn't really in the models that we have. The prices of particular salient items like food and energy also seem to affect inflation expectations. They kind of outsize effects. Um, the empirical results also show that um, we don't really understand the direction of causality, right? It's not clear. So, you know, do, do high inflation measures cause inflation expectations to rise? Or do higher expectations about inflation affect the decision making, which is something Ricardo was getting at, um, leading to higher inflation, or is it both? So that's a, it's a problem because you have to then infer something and it's not even clear from reduced form estimates which way it goes. And the other thing we know is that while businesses are the ones that set prices, we only have limited information on inflation expectations for businesses, although work's being done both in, in the Euro, Euro ECB is doing work and the Fed is doing work to try to 
increase our knowledge of, of business expectations. I think another very practical consideration for policymakers is how to assess whether inflation expectations are becoming unanchored from the target. And relatedly, the level of degree, or the level of the central bank's credibility in the eyes of, of the public. So you can look at levels of longer term expectations relative to shorter term expectations to get some indication. Um, you know, for example, if longer term expectations are stable in the face of a positive shock to inflation, then that would be some indication the public believes inflation will come down. Although it need not indicate that they believe that monetary policy will be the main driver of that reduction. And in addition to the stability of the mean or median level, dispersion across survey respondents might also indicate how well inflation expectations are anchored with lower dispersion indicating better anchoring. So I think we need to be looking at all those measures. We have to look across different actors, agents in the economy to understand their expectations. And we, look, we need to look at more than just mean or medians. We, look, we need to look at distributions. Policymakers also have to contend with the possibility that financial markets may have more confidence than the general public in the central bank's ability and commitment to bring inflation back to goal. And I think that, again, it suggests that policy communications are going to be important for keeping inflation expectations anchored. So taken all together, the research suggests that there's still much to learn um, about how inflation expectations are formed. Yet, as a policymaker, we need to make decisions um, based on the limited information we have. And the recent data in the US indicate that longer term inflation expectations are still below current inflation readings. So you might infer that the public expects inflation to come back down um, from its unacceptably high level. But if you look at measures of longer term expectations, they are rising at longer horizons. Um, and that's problematic. And if you look at dispersion, and this is the uh, household uh, expectations, that dispersion across um, survey respondents is also increasing. So this is looking at dispersion measured by the 25th percentile and 75th percentile in the units of Michigan inflation survey. So I think the fact also that sailing in prices like food and gasoline um, remain elevated suggests that there is some risk that longer term inflation expectations of household and businesses will continue to rise from the current levels. So what do you do on the current situation? From a risk management perspective, I think it's important for policymakers to ask which situation would be more costly. Erroneously assuming longer term inflation expectations are well anchored when in fact they're not, or erroneously assuming that they're moving with economic conditions, and in this case moving up, when they're actually anchored. And if you do simulations using the board's Furvis model, they suggest pretty strongly that the more costly error is assuming inflation expectations are anchored when they're not. If they're drifting up and policymakers treat them as stable, what ends up happening is policy will be set too loose. Inflation would then be moving up, and this would be reinforced by increasing inflation expectations. On the other hand, if the expectations are actually stable and policymakers view the drift up with concern, policy will be initially be set tighter than it should. And inflation might move down and might even go below target, but not for long, because inflation expectations are anchored at the goal. So those simulation results, coupled with the research suggesting that persistent elevated inflation poses an increasing risk then inflation expectations could become unanchored, strongly argue against policymakers being complacent about a rise in longer term expectations. I think it's important to remember that inflation expectations are determined not only by movements in inflation, but also by policymakers' actions to follow through on their, on their strongly stated commitments to return inflation to the longer run goal, thereby justifying the public's belief in the commitment. So obviously, the current inflation situation is a very challenging one, uh, both here in Europe and in the US. Central banks are going to need to be resolute, and they're going to need to be intentional, intentional in taking actions to bring inflation down. If you think back to the low inflation we had 
in the pre-pandemic expansion. That really led to considerable research. Um, the ECB uh, is at the forefront of that research, as is the Fed, on how low equilibrium interest rates and the zero lower bound can create a downward bias to inflation and inflation expectations. And the policy implication that some drew from this research was, was that if policy had to err, it should err on the side of being too accommodative since it would be easier. I'm going to emphasize that it would be easier to address high inflation than low inflation. OK. I think the current situation, very challenging one, in which a sequence of supply shocks have contributed to inflation being at a 40-year high, belies that view. I think it also calls into question the conventional view that monetary policy should always look through supply shocks. In some situations, such supply shocks could threaten the stability of inflation expectations, and they would require policy action. So my hope is that this situation that we're in, um, just as a period of low inflation generated uh, important research, that we'll have a, a, a new burgeoning research, and we saw some of it actually this morning, um, to help us actually un understand more about high inflation, the role of expectations, and how supply conditions matter, um, as well as demand side factors. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Loretta. So I must say you were uh, very consistent with, with what you said six weeks ago, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. So our, our third panelist uh, is Ulrike Malmondier, who is a professor of finance and economics at the University of uh, California at Berkeley. So I'm very happy that uh, you can join us uh, remotely. This is uh, very much appreciated. And uh, as you probably all remember, um, uh, Ulrike has not only explained to us why we pay for not going to the gym, but she has also done some uh, fascinating research on the formation of inflation expectations. And uh, she is um, well known for thinking out of the box. And so I'm very curious uh, to hear your insights on inflation expectations. So Ulrike, it's great to have you here, even if only on the screen. Uh, thank you so much for including me in this super interesting and topical panel. Um, I hope the Wi-Fi will hold up where I got stranded. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do in my brief statement uh, today is to draw your attention, to make you pause and, and, and think about what the current experience of living through an inflationary period uh, will do to our beliefs and ultimately our decision making, um, where we as both households uh, and firms and actually monetary policy makers, and then as a result, what this means for inflation expectations as a variable of interest uh, for monetary policy. The starting point is, of course, uh, the research Isabel uh, alluded to, that we have now accumulated lots of evidence. Dispersion within a population, it turns out that the personal experience of past inflationary periods or high stability periods has a lasting and, and very strong impact. So here, for example, is an updated graph using a US data from the Michigan survey. The dots just show one year ahead inflation expectation um, separately for people below 40, 40 to 60 in red, above 60 in, in blue, um, after taking out the population mean, so showing the disagreement. And what you can see, first of all, if you just focus on those dots as well, sometimes older generations are more pessimistic, sometimes younger generations are more pessimistic. Sometimes the different generations have pretty similar views on inflation, and sometimes there's huge dispersion. And, and noteworthily, um, in particular in the period of the 70s up to 1980, there was increasing dispersion up to three percentage points at the time. Now, it turns out if you're trying to predict these cross-sectional differences after accounting for your usual um, suspects in terms of demographic, uh, you know, wealth education and stuff, but even monetary policy with fixed effects, that individual level, lifetime exposure to inflation is enormously powerful. Those are the fitted lines I drew in here, the solid and, and the dashed lines. It turns out that if you, know, you give me your birth year, I get data on the inflation you have experienced over a lifetime so far. I average it with somewhat declining rates. There's some recency bias. I get a lot of predictive power. 
So our personal experiences stay, seem to stay with us. We tend to put more weight on uh, realization of experience over our lifetimes than other historical data. In some sense, this is a relative of the adaptive learning models, but the big difference is that it's crucial not just to say, oh, pe people overweight recent realizations. Everybody puts too much weight on the last year or last five years or wh wh whatever you prefer. No, it depends. If you're 20 year old, you have seen, you know, what happened in the last uh, year or two. And then before that, you have not seen. If you are 60 year old, uh, sorry. you remember of the 1980s. Uh, Ulrike, um, we yes. have a, a slightly broken connection. So maybe it's better if you, uh, if you turn your uh, video uh, off. I think then we can still see the slides, right? That's possible. <laughs> Yeah, Maybe that's better that. because we sometimes lose your voice, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And, and please interrupt again. Um, I'm, I'm happy to kind of just uh, go back a slide. But um, what I was trying to say here is that uh, there's lots of data now on past realizations having an overproportional influence on our expectations, uh, actually not only in inflation, also in the stock market, for example, in unemployment experiences, stay with us, we stay, remain cautious spenders for years to come, even if life cycle consumption savings models would say otherwise. And these, uh, these effects do not only af uh, affect what we answer in the survey question of inflation expectations or other expectations, they affect uh, actual decisions, as also um, Ricardo alluded to, you know, in, in, in this case, investment long-term bonds, are you shying away from it? Do you buy a house or not? Do you use a fixed rate or variable rate mortgages, etc. Now, while I'm focusing here on households, I do find, uh, I do want to pause and say, it's not only households who exhibit this behavior. Um, in one of their New Zealand manager papers, um, this one, the uh, Brookings paper by Kuma, Afruzi, Kwabian, and Gronichenko, they asked um, managers of, of, of the New Zealand firms, how do you typically form your inflation expectations? And the top four answers included uh, shopping experience and prices of competitors and suppliers. So in other words, the prices they see around themselves right now in the recent past have an overproportional impact on uh, their forecast of future inflation. There's also um, meetings and discussions, so information you get from other people, but it's not financial advisors, it's not monetary policy experts, it's actually people like me, coworkers and family. And uh, it, it seems to be the case that information coming from people who identify with information that resonates resonates seem to have an impact and maybe we can get back to that later in the discussion thinking about what the central banks uh, could do. Uh, but finally, after covering households and firms, I do want to talk also about monetary policymakers themselves being strongly affected by their prior experiences. So my favorite example is a guy born as Heinrich Wallich in Berlin uh, in Germany in 1914 into a family of bankers, lived through Germany's hyperinflation in 1923 and then emigrated to the US in the 1930s, where he had a very successful career in the Fed system, first in New York Fed, got a PhD at Harvard, Fed governor from mid 70s to uh, 80s. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, he still holds the record in uh, Federal Reserve history of dissenting the proposal of the chairperson and kept warning people that, you know, they don't understand the dangers of inflation, how it's around the corner, it's imminent, etc. So why I love this anecdote so much, and I think right now Henry Wallach would appreciate being cited during the current period, um, is that this is clearly a highly educated person, has all the inflation data at the fingertips, uh, models available, knows in, that he's in a different country in a different time period and still cannot shake that experience. But I do not have to go to him. I can also look at the semi-annual monetary policy reports and the forecasts, one year had forecasts uh, members make in those. Um, if you correlate them, if you plot them again, their personal uh, experience-based uh, inflation forecasts. So I get, you know, Loretta's and everybody's birth year, look where they lived and, and calculate their lifetime average of inflation experience. I get to predict why they deviate from their staff forecast and very strongly so. So why is that? Why do our personal experiences stay so strongly with us, even if we are highly informed, know the models, et cetera? Why does it on the margin push us quite strongly in one direction or the other? Well, the message today might be that we should pay a little more attention to neuro rather than knowledge, whether we have the information. We should acknowledge that as you know, living and breathing organisms, 
um, our brain keeps changing as we walk through life. Um, every new experience leads our brain to form a new connection between neurons, these synapses that tell our body to react to the world, how to react to the world around us. Importantly for the inflation um, situation we are discussing, how and how often we make an experience matters. So uh, Loretta mentioned uh, repeatedly um, gas and food prices, which get this overproportional weight. That's exactly consistent. If you have repeated stimulation, um, or, or particular over a prolonged time, that causes long-term potentiation. Every time you go to the gas pump, you see the higher price. You can just not stop your brain from forming a strong association between gas and, and, and high inflation fears. In fact, the word fear is important here because um, neuroscientists talk not only about synaptic tagging, but emotional tagging emotional events attain privileged status in memory. So if this would you know, result in some kind of panic, anxiety, fear, um, that's how we ensure that's really deeply ingrained uh, in the population, which of course we would want to uh, avoid. Um, learned knowledge, you know, as much as we finance professors think we can fix this by explaining the seasonal AI warp model better uh, of, of inflation, um, has very limited power to undo this. Um, I think a good reference is the literature on tra trauma, how synaptic changes are caused by tra traumatic stress. And it's a good reference also because trauma is not only the big T trauma, the, you know, traditional, I mean, in, in the, the neuroscience literature, the war experience, adverse childhood experiences, or in the econ environment, the German hyperinflation or Great Depression or pandemic. No, there's small T trauma. The daily exposure to increasing prices, even if that doesn't completely destroy your livelihood, the daily worry about food, food insecurity, unemployment insecurity, which reshapes and reforms our brain and leads us to think differently about the world. Uh, one of my favorite examples are those gender differences, which I uh, saw Loretta also mentioning uh, on her, I think, third slide. There is now, I think, over 50 years of evidence, maybe starting from a paper in, uh, with Swedish data, that uh, women tend typically to have higher inflation expectations. So um, when we did a survey, uh, we found this even during the low inflation period, this data up to 1950, uh, 2015-16, even within households, the male and female uh, heads of household differ in the inflation expectations controlling for everything. Where does that come from? Well, you know, it's not literacy, it's not education. It turns out that the prices males and females see in their daily life have a lasting and strong impact. So what we did, for example, is to look at uh, who does the grocery shopping in your household. So traditional gender roles um, makes that very much the woman still. Um, and uh, however, in those households where the men indicated that they do at least some of the shopping, the gender differences in inflation expectations completely disappears. And that, of course, then reflects the highly volatile food prices where people tend to latch on to the increases rather than decreases. So to conclude, uh, in terms of implications for monetary policy, the experience effect um, perspective kind of highlights three or maybe four things. First, um, frequency of being exposed to signals is really important. This explains the overproportional roles of food and gas prices, personal shopping. So from a monetary policy perspective, it will be important to acknowledge it and um, understand that that's a lived reality of consumers uh, rather than just saying, well, those, those vo high volatility items, they really just uh, obfuscate actual inflation trends. Let's just focus on core inflation. If we do want to understand where expectations come from, we need to acknowledge frequency more. Similar to duration, inflationary experiences are extra powerful if uh, they remain high for a long time. The effect will last for a long time. So you might want to account for that in your policy choices that once we are back to before, we are back to 2014-15, people will still be different. They will still make different spending decisions and form different expectations. This is particularly true if these events get emotionally anchored. Uh, panic means strong anchoring in me memory. So uh, obviously it is a uh, key from a monetary policy perspective to try and combat that, uh, but not by kind of trying to teach people, oh, food and gas, that's only 15% of a typical urban consumer's consumption bundle. No, acknowledge that's their lived reality and reassure it, maybe use more resonant uh, um, uh, channels of information conveyed by people which know their world, if it's managers which live in their managerial world, pay those prices to convey this information. And then finally, I also wanted to talk about the anchoring, the anchoring uh, topic, which is of course on our mind. And to some extent, the perspective of experience effect breaks a little bit the link, maybe to the usual way we think about credibility. Right, so normally we think of uh, inflation as well anchored around, say, the two percent target. Oh, that means the central bank is credible and can 
you know, pursue effective monetary policy. The perspective I have been giving you says, well, <laughs> their expectations very much reflect what they have experienced. Um, so if that says 2%, they will answer 2%. And if that says 5%, they will say 5%. It does not necessarily undermine the credibility in the sense that the central bank is not clear on their triggers for decisions and it's not following through, et cetera. So expectations are important in that they show whether the central bank is doing its job, but just in the sense of fighting inflation reality um, than the credibility. As a result, some of the monetary policy topics, such as forward guidance, might not be as powerful as, as we have thought. And I'll stop here. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ulrike. I think I didn't, I didn't promise uh, too much. Um, so I very much hope that you are also going to talk in the discussion a bit about the kind of innovative proposals that you had, how we, uh, uh, what we can actually do to also, uh, you know, reach these portions of the of the brain that uh, may at the moment be affected by by high uh, high inflation. So we are now moving to our fi final speaker, uh, who is Eric Nielsen, a Group Chief Economic Advisor at Uni. Credit. So he is the person sitting every weekend in a Berlin cafe <laughs> to write his very popular Sunday rap, to which one may not always agree, but which is always thought provoking. And we're, of course, very curious to hear your views a bit also from the market's perspective. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to, to uh, Sintra again. And thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, very honored to be here. I am, uh, as you said, I'm, uh, or like Ricardo said, I'm from the dark side of the markets uh, who are not only paid to be different, but also um, uh, always wrong, I think you said. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so let me try to give you the perspective from the market. And not only markets in terms of financial markets, but also markets in the, the corporate sector. We are a corporate bank. So I also, sort of my... Uh, most interactions with clients are actually with European corporates and what we hear from them. So I try to give you a sense of this. Uh, certainly one thing I would say is that the conversations in markets, both financial markets and corporate markets, picked up very dramatically this year. I mean, this was a, the, the discussion of inflation expectations was not something we did talk a lot about before, uh, way back to some extent, but certainly this has picked up. So this is a really hot topic uh, and very important, obviously. If I can just summarize, the key message I hope you take away from what I say today is the following. Inflation expectations, certainly the medium term to longer term inflation expectations, are definitely really important for the credibility of the central bank. No question about it. I will not doubt that one moment. But my sense, in my assessment this year, the, the, the amount of, or the, the impression I get is that the, use, the, the, the references to inflation expectations on a monthly basis, even sometimes more frequent, in terms of not setting the direction of monetary policy, but sort of moving the, this or, or indicating changes to the steps, I think is excessive. There's a risk of being too pointy. Monetary policy, I don't need to tell you, but monetary policy is more an art than a science. And it, yes, data dependent, but, but I, I, my key message here is that I, I worry a little bit that they pay too much attention to it. And let me try to illustrate that very quickly um, uh, by, by sort of two segments on what I'm going to say. First, the market-based inflation expectations. I have sort of two key concerns. Number one, uh, what Ricardo talked about with a five-year, five-year, uh, a little bit dramatic how it's gone up. What I see in the five-year, five-year is volatility. It came down, as, uh, as Ricardo said, I'll just remind you, we were down at 175 earlier this year, then it jumped up or moved up to two and a half, and then less than three months ago, and now it's back at around number two or thereabout. Which, if I were a central bank, I'd say very good. No, no drama, people are believing in us, and, and rightly so. But it's volatile, right? So, and, and remember, I don't need to, to remind you, but monetary policy has a, a policy-relevant horizon, which is not the next couple of months. So, so for me, it is a, uh, it, it's too volatile, if I may say so. Um, the second uh, point uh, that I have for the worry about the market-based, or the, what we read in the markets, is what you have said in several of your speeches, and Philip Lane also, and others, 
uh, which is that it's, it's kind of a messy instrument, right? It's, uh, if you, you have to try to take the liquidity and risk premium out, and I, uh, I, I could have shown this uh, chart that you had, uh, Isabel, uh, a couple of months ago in, a, in a, one of your many fantastic speeches, where you looked at the inflation risk premium on a one-year, three-year ILS. And what I saw from that was that that premium moved from deducting 80 basis points early in 2020 to adding 40 basis points at the time you spoke. And it's about the same place now, I think. That's a whopping 120 basis point shift in that noise inside what would have been the policy relevant period, right, from 2022 into, 2020 to into now. So I, I, interesting, and it's, uh, it's important work, but I, I take away from this that this is, a, uh, again, a, as I said, too volatile and too many distortions, and I, I know I'm stepping into dangerous territory now, now but it's a, looking at that as a, as a guide for policy uh, direction, it's a little bit like the focus on the neutral rate. Neutral rate, fantastic economic concept, wonderful, exposed, ex anti, we don't really know. So this is a really, uh, I think it's an important thing to do, to, to worry about. In other words, and this comes now to Ricardo's point of, uh, of my professions, uh, having spent my life. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, if, if you adjust the, 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 uh, the market-based inflation expectations for the noise, it really becomes not much more than a weighted average of professional forecasters. And we have not been very good. Right? It's like the fact is that I've done this for 25 years, and I will eat humble pie with anybody around here. We've been terribly wrong. I mean, it's a, it is, the fact of the matter is the market prices something they expect, but they don't know anything of them about the future, more than we do or you do. So, it's like, so to be too, uh, using it as a tool, I, I, I worry about. Um, now, that leads me then to just a more sort of anecdotal side to, to this. Um, it's a good time to, to tell you that since the ECB, which is the part of the major central bank I spend more time thinking about with clients, sort of moved on from, from financing conditions as a key measure that was always measured or talked about to normalization, uh, and, uh, and now and then uh, inflation expectations, an enormous increase in conversations picked up. So clients called from the financial markets for corporates and, and, and what have you, an enormous rich discussion pursued. And the only thing I can take away is that even market professionals suffer from the same thing as research shows that the general public and corporates and households suffer from, which is basically a lot, a lot of lack of knowledge probably. Many people don't really know what inflation is. I mean, so what index we are talking about, what's in it. Uh, they generally, until a couple of months ago, overestimate what inflation actually is. Uh, they also do not seem to know, most people, that generally speaking, inflation expectations have been higher than actual inflation turned out to be. So there's a, there's a lot of, of confusions out there. That was the first segment, and I am right on time. Uh, the second uh, point I, uh, I, I want to talk briefly about is the survey-based. And I'm, I'm only talking about the, the medium, longer term. I, I think short term should not really worry anybody. And I have three observations. The first one, they are also prone to change or revisions. And I will say with all respect that uh, when the University of Michigan revised its, uh, its uh, inspection number last Friday, I have never spent so much time talking to financial market participants about a revision of a number of, from 3.3 to 3.1, uh, and we know why. <laughs> so this, is, this was become the only conversation the markets had for a good long time. So that is a, a, a one thing to maybe keep in mind, it's it, one number. Then there's a second question, which is reflecting what I said before, namely, that is, from my conversation with our corporate clients, who are often, many of them part of the surveys, not completely clear that they know what they're being asked or what they reflect on. There's often confusion between micro and macro. Do they talk about input prices or can they put on to output prices? That's the conversation now. There are questions about the index, which one it is. It is it an index they care about or their personal or their business index? And for, for bigger or more senior uh, uh, corporates or clients, 
it's often then confused with asset prices also. So there's a, there a lot of noise in this that makes me somewhat nervous about the, um, the usefulness of it. So that, this leads me to my final point, which is what act, the only reason why inflation expectation may matter, obviously, is the risk that they lead to higher wages and then the self-fulfilling story. And that is certainly something that I, I respect and I, I know is a very important. Um, I'm not so sure. I mean, we know economic research shows there is a good correlation, a very strong correlation. But, uh, but I am a little, I'm still somewhat nervous now. I can, I can see the ECB's concern about the upcoming wage negotiations in particular Germany and the effect of the indexation of minimum wages in France and other places, and then the spill through, of course. I respect all this. I suspect, and I would love to be told I'm wrong, but I strongly suspect that when you see unions now ask for higher wage growth uh, or, or in negotiations, that has virtually nothing with inflation expectations and everything to do with past inflation and, a, and an attempt to recover some of the loss that their members have, have had. And that's, of course, leads to this very difficult question, that we had a massive, massive supply shock. That's a tax on society paid to somebody else outside the Eurozone. And it's a question of who carries the cost. How do we distribute it, ultimately? And that's a policy decision that is well beyond my pay grade. But this is ultimately where it comes down to. So here's my conclusion. Monetary policy is immensely complex. I've studied it for most of my life. It's obviously, it, as I said, it's more an art than a science. It's uh, obviously, it has to be data dependent, but it is, it is, in my opinion, dangerous, and it may be very tempting if one has a bit of that incentive function that we heard in the previous speeches that I agree with, and I can understand the incentive function to be on the cautious side before getting it wrong, of not doing enough, is of course could be very damaging for the institution's credibility, I understand that, but the Maybe, and I fear a little bit from what I sense from my standpoint, is that there is a little bit too much attention to trying to pick numbers that sort of, of gives you the story that, that explains it. And then the risk is that one picks individual numbers that are very, very volatile and maybe not so meaningful. So uh, my two cents worth would be that uh, we all understand it's very, very difficult to run monetary policy. Uh, and I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't set policies on the basis of one or two individual numbers. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Eric. Actually, I have a, I have a short uh, qu uh, question and comment on, on what you said. So I was surprised that you said that risk premia are noise and are not informative. I would have said they actually contain useful information about the uh, uncertainty about inflation uh, going forward. And, and therefore, I would not say that we can say it's simply noise. And the, the question related to that is, a couple of years ago, when, when uh, you know, inflation expectations were going down, did you have the same interpretation of the risk premia? Um, to be honest, I don't really know. I, I, I didn't think that much. We were, we were more worried about deflation, right? And we were looking at this. And it, but, it, but it reminds me of, of there, was a, there was a lot of criticism, I think, among many, when at this place in 2019, another dose of QE was announced very much on the back of a five-year, five-year. And I, I shared that view. That was, that's one indicator that starts to look. Of course, there's a risk of deflation. So, it's a, so at that time, I, I, personally, I was not as aware of the risk premium, of the, of the movements as I am today. So it's a, that's a short answer. But. All right. So, so thank you very much. So um, actually, I, I think we can say that we all agree that inflation expectations in principle matter. And to be fair to Charles Gotthard, who's uh, of course a very, uh, 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 an excellent economist uh, whom I uh, admire quite a bit. I mean, he's of course, he, he never said that inflation expectations don't matter, but he said there is a certain overemphasis of inflation expectations in the discussion. And I actually heard that you I'm share that the, view. And the other point he made is that we have to think about the causality and that was a point that you also made. So normally I wanted to have a round now among the, uh, the four of you, but I must admit that you all uh, took so much time 
time for your presentation, so I think we cannot do that, otherwise we won't have questions from the floor. So I would like um, uh, to move directly uh, to the floor. I will connect, uh, collect uh, uh, maybe three questions. Oh my God, I have many questions. So, okay, so let's, uh, let's start on that side. So Markus, please. Thank you, a very nice panel, nice discussion. I have uh, three questions. One, the first one is to Ricardo. If you think about de-anchoring, would you look at the headline or the core inflation index? And in particular, if households de-anchor, do they care not more about the headline than about the core? So, and often, when we do monetary policy, we focus too much on the core and too little on the de-anchoring. Another question to Loretta. In terms of what wasn't emphasized so much is communication. How much of the communication should be targeting the market, the financial markets, how much the households and how much the firms. Are we overemphasizing how much we talk to the markets and too little to the real economy? And then uh, I would like to ask Ulrike, um, of course, within the euro area, we have, of course, different countries which had different uh, experiences before the euro on inflation experiences. Have you looked at some within the euro area that people who have experienced high inflation because before the euro came into place, and they also have high inflation expectations now, and hence they're more hawkish uh, at this stage? Thanks. Thank you very much. So take me, uh, let me take one from the middle. So uh, James, please. <laughs> uh, Jim Bullard, St. Louis Fed. So uh, I think there was evident or. Um, emphasis on the panel about discounting past observations, and I think that's certainly the case when you get practical about uh, measuring inflation. So does the panel think that inflation expectations are at more risk of becoming unmoored in the current environment where you're, you're starting to discount some of the very stable data that we had in the pre-pandemic pre uh, era and putting more weight on the very recent outcomes and um, that seems like that could be very risky for both uh, the U.S. and for the ECB. Thank you very much. Okay, so Bea, please. Thank you very much. Um, one question in terms of particularly household inflation expectations and, and the policy response to a potential, uh, the anchoring or too high inflation, because um, does it matter, you know, the, the, a, lot, a lot of central banks often take um, confidence, or the ECB in particular, to say, well, market pricing has moved, so there is obviously a tightening of financial conditions, and so we are already on a good way. Um, but the question is, do households, do regular people really notice that if the actual policy rate is still negative in this case, and might be negative in September, still uh, until September if we take the current communication, and doesn't it mean that, for example, for floating rate mortgages, is they're still extremely low? So does it really have an impact on these expectations? I guess on the, on the Fed side, you could argue that the most prominent mortgages, 30 years, they are now around 6%, so obviously there has been a, a very big change, and so there it matters, but on the euro area, I'm not so sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So actually, I will take uh, uh, th three other questions. So, uh, Michala, Sylvia, Vitor. So thank you very much, and, and thank you for three very interesting presentations. It, it seems to me that, that fiscal policy is, is also a key factor in, in what's happening today in the policy mix. And I wonder, when we think about inflation expectations, to what extent people's expectations on the fiscal policy stance would be playing in. Um, it seems to me that, especially with the pandemic, um, the previous uh, expectation on fiscal discipline has really changed in the minds of, of households. So I was wondering if this is something that, that you have thought about and, and how it feeds in. Thank you. So we need the mic here, so one of you first. Hi, thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Uh, my question to Ricardo on linking uh, behavior to expectations and, and I would say also vice versa. Uh, one on wage formation, uh, I think we have some data that show that workers are getting higher wage increases for these current years, but they accept 
lower wage increases for year two or year three, multi-year uh, negotiations, what do you make of that? And second, when you look at household surveys of, uh, uh, from the European uh, Commission, uh, they all expect prices to keep increasing in 12 months horizon, but you have not seen any increase in consumption. 7M has shown the consumption data, even the high frequency are disappointing, and on expectations of future consumption, they're also lower. So how would you link these two? To your model. Thanks. Can you pass on the mic to Vitor, please? Well, th thank you. I am on the, tr on, on the side of Charles Goodhart in the, uh, showing some skepticism about uh, the importance of expectations. And I would like to ask Ricardo and Loretta uh, if they can clarify to us how exactly they think that expectations and expectations of whom really influence price formation in our economies. One stylized fact that the uh, economy is dominated by uh, uh, imperfect competition markets with pricing power by firms. Also many surveys show that more than 50% of the firms use a markup model to uh, uh, take decisions on prices and so how exactly uh, are the mechanisms that lead, say, from uh, uh, forecasts of inf uh, expectation of inflation by households and the end price formation? One thing is clear, the expectation of households about inflation affect their behavior on consumption and, uh, and savings and, uh, and whatnot, but not necessarily on price formation. Because when Phelps and uh, Friedman introduced expectations in the Phillips curve, they were thinking about the importance of uh, collective wage negotiations between trade unions and firms and uh, expectations and information on both sides and all of that. That has, over decades, disappeared in advanced economies. Trade unions uh, wane, even in Germany. Only 15% of the workforce belongs to uh, unions currently. Uh, so. Uh, after the late 60s, you don't find examples of the importance of those age, uh, wage negotiations in advanced economies. So how exactly does that? Just, uh, uh, I would like to draw attention to a paper uh, by the ECB of last year, uh, 2006 and four, the working paper that asks, do inflation expectations improve forecasts of inflation, which is a different question. It's not about how uh, expectations impact the uh, formation of prices, but about if they help to predict inflation. And very briefly, they conclude uh, the following. They use 18 models, reduced forms, and uh, three uh, Bayesian VARs uh, to predict inflation. And they conclude, first, that expectations coming from surveys either of households and firms do not contribute to improve the forecast of inflation. And, uh, and uh, also what comes from extracting from financial markets also doesn't improve. Only what comes from uh, the survey of professional forecasters and consensus uh, improve by about 10% in what regards forecasts of uh, uh, headline inflation and up to 20% in what regards forecasts of core inflation. So that introduces some skepticism from this angle, which is different from the first I asked about, uh, this angle of uh, expectations contribution to improve forecasts of inflation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so maybe you can try to be very concise because I have more questions in the audience and I would like to give everybody the floor who wanted uh, to have it. So we go in reverse order maybe. So Eric, whatever you want to respond to. Right. Um, maybe Beard's uh, point, there was no specific otherwise, I think, but it's on, on consumers. I think this is a... a Personally, I, I, I don't know of any... I, I think Vitor now said it actually. There is, there is no real research that... that that gives credit to the importance of it. Um, but you said something else which I, that triggered my mind, which is that, uh, that the ECB has actually already implemented a very significant monetary tight or withdrawal of stimulus, right, by a forward guidance, so the market had pre-priced dramatically. Um, and uh, since you were so kind to 
to refer to my beloved Berlin. Uh, on Saturday, I was at my whole fest in Berlin, and three of my neighbors, when they heard I was going to Centra, and I have to explain what Centra was, <laughs> were telling me about the reset of their mortgages, which was close to a doubling of their monthly payment. Right? And one of them, two of them were small business people, right? So it's, so it's hitting already, right? It's, uh, so it's very, and this is in Germany even. So, uh, so um, you've done very well in, in, in getting going, but it's, uh, so, uh, so it's, uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's felt. So, and that was on household, small business, but you think of them as households. Thank you. Details upon request. <laughs> uh, Ulrike? Uh, yeah, just uh, two or three quick things. Um, first, on, on Marcus's question, uh, there is indeed uh, research on the different inflation experiences across different uh, countries by Airman and, and others, which shows that that has still impacting inflation expectations today and explains some of the cross-country differences. Uh, we've also shown that this in turn shapes housing markets. So people who have, uh, I'm not Ulrich Binzal, but fine. Um, uh, people who have experienced high inflation um, will uh, look for hedges, and uh, one of the hedges is kind of fixed rate mortgages, and that uh, those past experiences strongly affect um, the rate of people uh, living in their, in their own home. Um, this then links to um, some of the questions about, um, you know, market might move, but the household, will households, will the regular consumer be, be affected? I think the third question. And um, indeed, that would be my perception. Exactly um, as, as, as you stated, like with what mortgage rate you are experiencing, what you're seeing in the prices is, I think, what will be in the, in the minds of consumers. And um, that will persist for a long time, which uh, briefly links to Sylvia's remark that consumption spending continues to be kind of uh, disappointing. That's exactly what um, this, this insight of really long lasting effects of past experiences would predict. We also saw it after the Great Recession in the US and other countries. Thank you, Ulrike. Loretta? Yeah, so just a couple of things. So Mark, is, it's communications not only to the market matter. So we're, you know, the communications, it's very important to talk to households so they understand what the policy goals are and what we're trying to do with policy. So I agree totally with you that we not just focus on t communicating with market participants, but also communicating with, with households and business people who are the, the price setters. Um, Jim, you know, the models that I've seen, the forecasting models of inflation, you know, there's different measures of, do you, you have forward-looking expectations or backward-working? All the estimates I've seen is there's much less weight on the backward-looking than the forward-looking. So I, take, I think your point is right, that in this environment, and this I think fits with the Eureka's um, results, is that the current situation has a higher potential of destabilizing inflation expectations. And Vitor, your, your question about Forecasting models, I mean, our res all research at coming out of Cleveland says it does reduce um, the forecast errors on inflation if you look at inflation expectations. Yeah, but I mean, it's still like a benefit um, to that. In terms of the actual mechanism, right, again, the, the research doesn't really tell you what the direction of causality is. When you talk to business people, one mechanism is they do think about markups because they're experiencing higher costs themselves. But how much they mark up when you talk to them depends on what they think inflation is going to be doing going forward. So how much do they think the Fed's going to get back down to 2%? And that's informing how they're setting their prices. Now, whether that's sustainable in a perfectly competitive market is, is debatable. But in the moment, that's kind of what they're doing. Yeah. No. Right. So, Ricardo. OK, a few points. First, is it hard to measure expectations? Of course it is. That was my very first point. Yeah. By the way, it's pretty hard to measure output gaps, in case you haven't noticed. And it doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to those when you're setting monetary policy. And if you're worried about picking numbers, boy, look what happened with picking, looking, overreacting to numbers on inflation measures over the last few months, Eric, where people are looking at different measures. You go up for some or more. So of course it's hard, and I hope that I made that very clear in my presentation. It is absolutely hard. And no, that's why also I even took numbers out of the axis to say, and always said maybe it's between two and three and a half, three and four. So I absolutely could not agree more. You do not over respond to 0.3% changes in expectations. Two, though, um, what is this? Um, what was this? Sorry. I don't know what this is. Second, though, um, do, should you not respond again to some of those measures? Again, as I showed, if 
market's expectations, they move all the time. I would never have respond to them. There were a lot of noise. And this is why, uh, as I try to emphasize, these expectations are useful in turning points. They're useful when you see very large deviations, when you see them all moving, as has happened, the professionals of the delay, but also happening. And so the point was that it's in turning points, not in a setting of policy month to month that one looks at expectations. And that was very much the point I try to make. Third, turning the professionals. The professionals, as Vito reminded, and absolutely is correct, professionals are very useful in forecasting. They add the forecasting power in normal times, but in spotting turning points, they, in the three or four examples we have in history, they got it wrong in the same way that the type of models of central banks in turning points often get it wrong because they're very biased on past data. That is the point I made, not that professionals are never worthwhile. I didn't say that. I said in turning points, the professionals' expectations tend not to go right. Inflation risk premium. If your model is telling you that inflation risk premium changed 120 basis points, at the same time where we see nothing comparable in equity risk premium or bond risk premium, there's something wrong with your model inflation risk premium. Not that the data <laughs> is uninformative and it's all noise. Um, and that's a point that I made very, very quickly also in my talk. I think the models that we use to measure inflation risk premium are just throwing a lot of stuff out, and Loretta also mentioned it as well. Fifth, and importantly, um, really to agree with the way Loretta put it, which, and to emphasize how consistent it is with what I try to do with my table, Loretta noted risk management. My table of shocks and how they work, that's the typical risk management table. And the point there is, maybe you want to ignore it if you focus on the first row, but if you take a risk management, all the other ones point in a certain direction, that if you want to interpret this somewhat as a danger, then you want to respond. And luckily in this time, all of them were actually pointing in very much a similar direction. And then briefly, two more points. On VTOR, on the expectations of firms, we have, I don't have data on expectations of firms in the euro area, but, when we look at expectations of firms, and I think it was Ulrika who mentioned in her talk, we have not found, and again, preliminary research, we meaning the community of researchers, not myself individually, have not found that firms are actually all that different from households. They seem to move with the households or if it's anything more with the professionals. So not having data, I'm gonna look at the households and say it's closer to those of the professionals. That's what the papers by Gornichenko and many others have found so far, substitute noise of that. How does the price formation work? Just like I told you, but I'd even go a little further back. Just like Friedrich Hayek or Ken Arrow taught us, in general equilibrium, you respond sometimes to the observations of what you see, not necessarily to some expectation of how the equilibrium works. Firms respond because all of a sudden they're facing higher wages, all of a sudden they're facing less demand for their product or more demand for their goods. That's what they're responding to. How, why did we have higher wages? Why do we have more or less demand? Because some households start expecting higher inflation. But the channels are there in general equilibrium. It's basically the fact that it's not that you say I'm responding exactly to someone's expectation. It's the fact that those in affecting shopping behavior, like Ulrich was noting, in affecting the way in which you choose a mortgage, this or that, that is going to affect relative demands. And as a business, all you have to do is Hayek and Arrow's insight. All I have to do is look at how many people are working through my shop, what is happening to my costs, I'm adjusting my prices, and lo and behold, what's happening to expectations and households, animal spirits, as I said, even if so, are being reflected in what I do, and that's why I even covered the animal spirits. And finally, on Sylvia, on the future expectations. Of course, also when looking at expectations, one, one has to, I think, take into account what we learned in the previous paper by Shebnam and others, which, and others, which is there is a supply shock going on, and therefore, given a supply shock, expecting both high inflation and expecting to spend less in the future is, if anything, a sign of some rationality of these consumers, which is not to say that the counterfactual, which is, if you had expected no higher inflation, would you have consumed a little more or a little less? And finally, on the wages, which you also mentioned, um, of course, it is consistent and possible, not to mention something to take into account, that as households are forming expectations of how life is going to be hard given the supply shocks, how unemployment may raise, and as prices may come, households may choose to, choose, choose is the wrong word, we may end up with wages rising less than inflation. In many ways, that fall in real wages may contribute to having less of unemployment next year. That is not inconsistent with being afraid of inflation, with monetary policy having to be tighter, um, 
as a response to those expectations, meaning it is not because we don't see wages going up by 8% next year that shows, aha, those expectations of 8% were not merited. No, because we have the supply shocks that should lead people to be expecting a real wage fall, as I would expect. The question, of course, is whether it's very large or very small. Sorry. Thank you very much. So we started a couple of minutes late, so I will have two more questions. I think John uh, was very early. And, uh, okay, Sasan. But please, uh, in the questions and in the answers, try to be as concise as possible. Just a quick comment on Ricardo, Ricardo's model, uh, which assumes that real rates always have a negative effect on consumption. And uh, that isn't, in fact, true. I mean, th theory says it could be, it's ambiguous. And in fact, in, in the euro area, German households take liquid assets minus debt to income. German households have the biggest ratio of net liquid assets um, in, in the Euro of major economies. And negative real rates uh, have a very negative effect on the expenditure of, um, of these households, particularly uh, the, um, older people with saving deposits who, whose deposits are vanishing in front of their eyes or, or falling in value in front of their eyes. So the expenditure effect for Germany on our aggregate data actually suggests there's a small perverse effect of real rates, other things being equal, on German consumption. Then over there, please. Uh, thank you very much, Sasan Garamani, SGH Macro Advisors. Uh, I'd like to pick up on some of the strands, including uh, Jim's comment here, a question, uh, and ask about non-linearity. Um, the economics profession tends to try to smooth out and look at sort of averages. Does vol I'll keep it brief and simple. Does volatility matter, uh, especially in an environment like this, just volatility per se, especially in the, in the instance where, you know, we have current expectations forming a lot of our actual behavior now, and I hear talk about, you know, sort of looking at the five year and sort of settling in on an average of eight, five, four, you know, whatever to three and a half, four percent. But isn't there a lot more dispersion and risk here that this sort of taking signals from this could be dramatically wrong at this point in time? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So not everybody has to respond. So who wants to? Please go ahead. No, oh, volatility matters hugely, and that's why in those measures I told those algorithms, try to really downweight, depending on variance, skewness, as well as volatility of the series, what they are. And absolutely, you do not want to respond uh, to any day-to-day, week-to-week, even month-to-month -month measure in those. Again, I try to be very careful. There's a change here, and then I kept on dismissing any movements up and down, month-to-month, -month of my own estimates, because I don't think you should in any way respond to those. And on the nonlinearity, turning points, that's precisely... Uh, the point I've been trying to drill in, which is uh, these data are useful to show you there's a switch here. There's a nonlinearity in terms of some regime changes. On the, um, just on the real rate perverse effect, John, um, I mean, I wrote down, it wasn't my model. It was just the standard New Keynesian model that, uh, which I thought was good to illustrate our models, uh, to illustrate the points that I, that I was trying to make. Um, on whether it's perverse, then I guess ECB then re changing nominal interest rates is going to have a perverse effect on Germany as well, no? Because the nominal interest rate, the real rates that you said is nominal interest rate minus expected inflation. If expected inflation is perverse, so is the nominal interest rate perverse. So maybe, so that's I think more to the monetary experts on whether raising or lowering nominal interest rates has perverse effects uh, in Germany or not. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants yeah, to? Can I add yes. something? So just to be clear, data dependency, at least in my conception of what we mean by data dependence, doesn't mean you react to every data point. You're inferring what's going on underneath in the economy and the things that you should care about, right? So that you Michigan survey wasn't the precipitating event of raising interest rates at the last meeting. It was really based on looking at the trends in the data and whether we were seeing any easing off of that inflation at all, and you know, we take all the data into account, at least when I'm setting my own policy views. It's based on not just one data point. It's important to know that. Um, so. All right, thank you very much. So I, I think we should come to an end of a fascinating session. So let me just try to wrap up a bit. So I think we all agree that inflation expectations matter, but that we should not 
overemphasize them. We should certainly look at different measures, taking into account the, the weaknesses and strength of the, uh, of the different um, measures. The dynamics of different measures can be quite different. So market-based measures may be overly influenced by current oil prices, while the household expectations may be very much um, influenced by the lifetime inflation experience. We are still uh, um, debating on whether uh, professional forecasts are useless or not. I think we haven't <laughs> made up our mind yet. So there is a lot of heterogeneity across uh, different uh, people. I think it's also clear that the anchoring of inflation expectations poses a threat to, um, to uh, central bank credibility. And I think the measures that uh, Ricardo has developed on that are extremely useful. Our commitment to price stability certainly matters. Communication matters, and I had hoped that Ulrike would mention it, but she was actually suggesting that uh, you, President, would start to, to sing your monetary policy statement next time to get to the, emotional, uh, to the emotions of our audience. <laughs> was a bit exaggerating. But, uh, so finally, once inflation expectations are de-anchored, it's very hard to uh, re-anchor them again because uh, part of the inflation experience may actually be built into the brain, and I think this is something we we should take very seriously. But with that, uh, I, I wish you all a, a, a very nice lunch. Thanks to our excellent uh, panel uh, participants for a fantastic discussion. Thank you.